Here we are in section B, question two. So the diagram shows below parts of the human brain. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see it's um, the hemisphere kind of cuts in half. Um, it would be beneficial um, just to label the parts before you start the question. So what you think A is, B is, C is, and D. Like you know, sometimes a previous question can help you if you're not sure about other labels. All right, so let's start up at 2.2.1. Identify part A. So part A is like a, a another little circle underneath the big circle. So the big one is the cerebellum, the big um, brain. And then the cerebellum, it has double L's. Because that's the little brain. Okay, so cerebellum is a little one. And obviously the cera is just brain. So cerebellum would be the small little brain. And cerebella would be the our uh, big brain. So cerebellum with the double L's and a little brain. So that's how I remember that. Right. Next ones. 2.2.2. Then it says... <coughs> <clears throat> state two functions of part D. Now, this is your cerebella. This is the big brain. So, obviously, it doesn't ask you to label part D. So, you don't need to write what is part D. But then, what is the function? So, obviously, you understand that the big brain does everything. So, like, be a little bit behind the brain is vision. As we move a little bit more forward, we have sensory. We have interpretation. We have... um little bit more all the way forward we have the frontal which is all our like movements or sensory is a little bit towards the back movements a little bit towards the front eye or optical vision towards the back so depending on what part of the brain you want to talk about or just general parts of the brain they asked only for two functions so if we think about it obviously the biggest thing is thinking so we would say something like about i don't know intelligence um or even memory maybe memory because um, obviously we store information in our brain. So memory and then obviously understanding that exactly where part D is pointing in that area is actually the sensory area, the parietal lobe in front of it being frontal. Um, so we could definitely say sensory. Um, and sensory could include the sight that's obviously in the further back areas that helps us see. Um, sensory being feeling and then obviously more towards the front would be our action um, type of movements or voluntary movements. But yeah, so just general functions of the big brain. Okay, that's 2.2.2. Then we had 2.1.3. Name the hormone secreted by gland C that has an effect on long bones. So obviously we know that long bones makes people gigantic. So if that would be... Um, <clears throat> the negative parts of having too much of this hormone, then we know that it could probably be growth hormone. Okay, the next one, so that was A, so we're doing B. So a mammary gland in the breasts. So we understand that the ones that have to do with the breasts, so if we run through them, um, prolactin, um, and the word lactin also reminds you a little bit of like lactose intolerant, something like lucky, something like milky. So then you know that prolactin would have been our best bet. You also have oxytocin, but that's on the opposite end. So definitely not what comes out with growth hormone. Um, 2.1.4 state one way in which the brain is protected so if you think about it so if you hit your brain how is my brain good protected the biggest one obviously is this um, bone so the cranium so obviously if you can't remember the cranium you can also think of the fluid so we know that the bone sits in like a fluid jelly like environment which is created by the meninges all right so there's a lot of ways that the brain is protected but if we just think of the um, outermost parts definitely the cranium so we'll just have that because that was the first one in mind 
the very next one is 2.1.5 describe the role of the hypothermius in thermoregulation all right so obviously you must remember thermoregulation has to do with the ability for us to regulate heat and then obviously we have to remember the main gland for heat which is our sweat glands so if we jump backwards um our sweat glands basically um either cool us off um by increasing sweats or decreasing sweats so then we basically take it from the beginning so how is thermoregulation you always need an input so it um receives information so let's go um let's go stimulus so i'm gonna make it super easy so that you can just remember but obviously you can put in words we're gonna have a stimulus so we're gonna have the heat or cold then it's gonna be on the receptors receptors from the receptors we know that we have to um regulate it to be either hot or cold so then we either open up or close up our um receptors which is obviously our sweat glands and therefore we either have secretion or not to combat the stimulus to equal the stimulus okay so as long as you understand the basic um thermal regulations so all thermal regulation or any hypo hypostasis will always have a stimulus a certain receptor that will cause um something to be so obviously a stimulus that will trigger um an imbalance that will then cause the receptors to open that will then counteract whatever initial imbalance that we had all right the very last one part b is involved in the homostasis control of carbon dioxide concentration in the blood State the location of the receptors that are stimulated by an increase in the carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. So this is 2.1.6. Eh? So carotid, carotid. Uh, just in case I spell it incorrectly, I will drop down the correct spelling underneath. R. Terry. And then B, name the two effectors of this impulse. So you can imagine um, if you wanted to control carbon dioxide, you'd have to um, take in a little bit of more oxygen. So you understand that there would be the heart. The heart rate would be affected and the heart rate always affects our lungs. So then we can talk about our diaphragm because our breathing um, would affect the lungs and the lungs would affect the diaphragm interchangeably all right so that's it